Hey, everyone. Welcome to the We're Not Lost Private Podcast. This is episode eight. I'm Joe. And unfortunately, Leighton is a little under the weather. We've sent him to the company aid station, see if he could get treated. But I am so pleased to uh, welcome our next guest, Adam. Feel free to 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 wax about your your projects but he is a author and historian of the 82nd airborne he is the kind of guest we love to get on because he knows all the intimate little stories about these fellas that are going to launch um with the 80th of d-day coming up soon i've been looking forward to this adam this is a um a great chance to sit and kind of set the table for the the d-day uh operation for overlord for neptune all those bits and pieces. Um, and you and I talked briefly before we came on and then, uh, you had sent us some pre-read material, which was pretty great. Um, unlike the 101st who landed the majority of the division landed in England in September of 43, the 82nd airborne had been, um, involved in combat operations up until that point. In fact, the 504th doesn't even, uh, they're still involved in the what is still the Anzio operation essentially. And they're, they, they remain in Italy where the rest of the division comes to England. But anyway, Adam, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Um, it is a great pleasure to have you on with us. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be on. So um, again, we talked a little bit before, before we came on. Um, Adam's um, got three books out right now and he's working on a fourth, which is uh, he's a co-author it's a second volume on the troop carrier uh, elements that that went in uh, that that served during World War II. Um, I'll leave you to to talk in a little bit more detail about about your books if you'd like. Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, I'd, I'll happily take any opportunity to talk about the books. <laughs> um, my first my first book in terms of the first project was when I was about 16, I started researching the 82nd time in England. And the reason why I did that was because, like a lot of people, I owe my interest in the Airborne to Band of Brothers. I won't mince words. That was got me really tuned into the Airborne side of military operations. Um, still regard Band of Brothers as, you know, one of the sort of key pieces of um film work if you want to call it that in influencing my interests um but i'm i was born in derby in the uk which is in the midlands and when i was about eight we moved across the border into leicestershire and as i was researching the airborne divisions that was when i came to learn that the 82nd had been camped in leicestershire prior to d-day and prior to uh, operation market garden um, so I started researching the division's time in England purely because I wanted to know more myself and B, because um, I'd always planned to, at some stage in time, write about the time in in the UK. Uh, the primary reason for that was because, obviously, as anyone listening that knows anything about the 82nd will know, there are, as with the 101st, tons of books out there that talk about the time in combat but very seldom do they go into any great detail about either division's time in the UK, really. Um, but one of the things that I found when talking to veterans at that stage was, as you inevitably found with a lot, there was a reluctance to talk in any great detail about time in combat. But when you mentioned England to them, all of a sudden their eyes lit up and they had lots of stories to tell about their time here. Um, because they were in, you know, by comparison, relatively stress-free periods of the war for them. Um, so that culminated in 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 a, in a release in 2015, um, and it's called "And Suddenly They Were Gone." The the, the name I got from um, a quote from a local um, in Quorn in Leicestershire. Essentially, they woke up on the morning of the 29th of May, which was the day the division moved to their embarkation airfields for D-Day. And all of a sudden, they just weren't there anymore. Um, and um, so that's where that name came from. Um, as I was doing the book, um, I I did a, uh, a memorial project 
to build two memorials to regiments of the 80, so three to two memorials to three regiments of the 82nd here in the UK at their former campsites. And we had three veterans of the division travel over to the UK in 2013 for the unveiling of these memorials, one of which was a gentleman called George Schenkel, who was uh, in E Company 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment. And when he got back to the States, I got an email from him saying, oh, Adam, I want you to write my book for me. <laughs> and uh, and that is not something that you say no to. If a veteran <laughs> says, you're going to write my book for me, the answer is just always yes. I've had a similar experience with Ed Tipper from uh, Easy's Third Platoon. Oh, okay, yeah. Five or six. He he basically poked his finger in my chest and said, "Hey, listen, you've got to write a book about about our company." Yeah. Um, like you said, it's very tough to say no. So okay. I'm in the process of writing the first volume of that. Um, oh, that will be great. That sounds like a great project. But, but I, I've spent a little bit of time with George over the years. Uh, first time oh. was at Fort Indian Town Gap. He came for the Battle of the Bulge event yeah. back, way back during my reenactment years. And um, and then again, later on at Dover Air Force Base, he came for a D-Day event because they had um, Turf and Sport Special there, which yeah. was one of the planes he jumped out of, yeah. which I thought was pretty pretty amazing to have him him there with that aircraft but yeah very outspoken guy uh, yeah, very lovely absolutely. guy yeah fun yeah. to talk to um yeah but please we, please continue <laughs> we, we we had some great times with with george uh bless him whilst he was still with us um we uh on several occasions in normandy um visiting some of the areas that he fought in normandy but he so yeah he sent me a um well he sent me some cds at first and then he sent me a load of print printouts of uh, George just had this habit of when he was when he remembered something, he was very computer savvy, which was unusual for veterans. So George and George had a um, uh, a uh, oh, I can't remember what they were, a MacBook, um, which I found quite surprising. But he <laughs> would if he had um, if something came to his head, he just jumped on his to, onto his MacBook and he wrote his the memory down. Um, and he printed it all off and he sent it to me and he, and he just went, you know, there you go, there's what you need. Um, and of course, there were there were quite a few gaps to fill here and there, um, particularly from a from a perspective of um, trying to make sense of the regiment's combat in Normandy, for example, uh, and also Market Garden. Um, but generally speaking, the memories that George had of his of his life leading up to the war and his experiences during the war um, were were quite vivid um so i put my work with my 82nd book aside did george's george's book if i remember correctly was released in 2014 and then my i i released my 82nd book in uh, in 2015 um george's book is called um a clear conscience because george is convinced that he went he managed to make it through the entire war without killing anybody which is a, a unique position to be in for anybody that was in the airborne, really. Um, but George always sort of referred to himself as borderline pacifist. The idea of killing somebody didn't sit very well with him. Um, but um, also as a radio operator, he he sort of strategically positioned himself as often as he could in a position where he didn't really have to necessarily directly engage the enemy. I think he mentioned that there was one occasion when they are in Holland where um, there's a certain terminology, something hitting the fan to the point where um, <laughs> he felt uh, the need to... You're free and clear to use whatever language is an adult, uh, okay. as an adult uh, <laughs> show. Okay, uh, well, I, I, hopefully most of the <laughs> listeners understand where, where I was going with that anyway. But I think he, they're picking up what you're putting down, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he, um, he, he uh, on that occasion, did have to, um, uh, let's say, defend himself. Um, but otherwise, he's fairly convinced that he managed to make it through the war n without killing somebody. So the book was called A Clear Conscience or My Clear Conscience. I can't remember now, which is bad. <laughs> um, but they're, they're both available via a UK publisher called Overlord Publishing. So if people want to get hold of a copy of either one of those books, they can do so uh, via Overlord. Um, but my my third book is is volume one of a three volume series about nine troop carrier command, which was the U.S. Army Air Force unit that was obviously primarily primarily responsible for deploying the airborne during the war in uh, in Europe. Um, which I co-author with a with a Dutch historian called Hans Den Brock, 
who is um super super knowledgeable troop carrier historian um and has spent the, the last two plus decades gathering information um which if i remember rightly from what he told me is all born out of the fact that in the small village or town where he lives in holland which is os uh, a solitary glider landed there after being released early during Operation Market Garden, and it was it was his research into that glider that led to him, you know, having a a particular affinity with Nine Troop Carrier Command. Um, volume one of that book series is actually at the moment not available because we've moved the release of that book over to a new publisher. Um, and it's been revised, so we've added another 150-odd pages, um, countless more images, uh, pictures that we unfortunately were kind of forced due to page limitations to miss out in vol in the first release. Um, so that is hopefully going to get re-released on the 6th of June this year. Uh, I know that um, I know that our listeners that are that are uh, fans of the troop carrier. Um command and the squadrons are, are going to be happy to hear that any additional information is always is always yeah, appreciated I, but i, I could tell you I've, I've read some excerpts of um and then they were gone and i was really impressed with it again i've, I've read a lot of uh phil nordyke's work on the 82nd it's it's always that personal feel that that tactical level feel the guy on the ground um with his eyes behind the sight of his m1 garand or his m1 carbine or his thompson those are the things that really um inflame people's imaginations and get them really thinking about the um the situation as described in the books and i can tell you that like i said the few excerpts i've read very impressed with the work and i think i think if our listeners take the time to pick up a copy of uh at least one of your books they'll get an appreciation for what these guys who wore the all-american patch uh, went through uh, i think they'll, I, they'll be very pleased with it i appreciate you saying that it means a lot coming from from you in particular um but yeah i mean I, I I always look back to a, a, a again it, it relates to Band of Brothers, but in twenty uh, sorry two thousand and four I think it was when I was not quite as old as I am now. Um, I <laughs> we all feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> I um I met while Bill Garnier and uh, Babe Heffron in Oldbourne in the UK. Scallywags. Um, yeah, um, and I was in. Um, I I just started, even despite the fact that I was, I think, seventeen at the time. I just started to reenact um, airborne forces, and there was one comment in particular that Bill Garnier he sort of looked me up and down, and he said, "You look like I did sixty years ago." <laughs> and to a seventeen-year-old, that was like, "Wow, you know, um, <laughs> it, it, you know, I, I've never really, I've you know, always idolized these men, and." Um, uh, to have somebody like Wild Bill say that to you is a huge moment. But it's be like always... if you were it'd be like if you were a musician and this and and Keith Richards said, "Man, you're a hell of a guitarist." Right? A hundred percent, yeah, yeah. It was it was a but it was one of those moments where I you know I, I still look back on it and I, I actually have photos of uh, of me meeting the two guys right in front of my desk. Um, but it's um, I I'd always I always thought at the time after meeting them, you know. Uh, they were the first World War II veterans that I met, um, to my knowledge anyway, that I was conscious of them being World War II veterans, if that makes sense. And uh, I remember thinking, particularly the way that, that Wild Bill spoke, um, was that they were just normal guys. You know, they were just like you and I. They would make jokes and they would they would you know, wisecrack with people and things like that. And and Babe was a little bit different. I don't know if you I'm presumably I'm I'm assuming that you met both of these guys, but oh, yeah. they yeah. <laughs> I, I I remember being quite conscious of the fact that Babe didn't seem to want to have his photograph taken with me. Yeah, a bit Whereas, more standoffish than Bill. Yeah. Uh, at times, um, yeah. He yeah. could be. <laughs> uh, but again it was it was one of those moments where you, again you just kind of thought, well, you know, there's a guy that that is probably not it's it's hard to describe what I mean by it, but he you know he wasn't that into the sort of adoration that he was getting, which kind of made him look more more humble and modest. And um... yeah, he tended he tended to shy away from it. He didn't really like the limelight very much. He was a little bit uncomfortable. With it. There was some um, by his own admission some scar tissue about um, uh, 
some stuff, some legalities that happened with regards to Band of Brothers and who owned the rights to songs. And mm. so there was some stuff like that, that that kind of colored the way he approached um, his interactions with the public. Yeah. Um, yeah. Over the years, I was able to get to know him pretty well. I you know, give him calls uh, quite often and and talk with him. Um, yeah. My I mean, buddy was, Tony, Tony was total. My buddy Tony was totally responsible for that. Um, but I mean, my first interaction was, at least to my memory, it was surprised the, the the folks that know me was not an easy company member. It was actually uh, Jack Agnew of the Filthy Thirteen. Yeah. Jack is they're one of those larger than life um, personalities at the time. Um, so I I I, to I totally understand what you're you're getting at in terms of. You know, these guys are like rock stars, mm -hmm. right? The way you approach them and you look at them, they've been portrayed on the, the small screen and um, it's, a, and they set the bar very high in terms of personality. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Um, but I think, you know, I think that um, what we, what we really want to kind of get to the nuts and bolts in of is the, is the divisions time in England, right? The, the yeah. 80 seconds time in England, because, even though they didn't have as much time in England to, to train and prepare, they were coming out of combat operations and they were able, like you said, to settle in. And I, you know, obviously I read the pre, uh, the pre recording material you sent and I noticed the similarities between the two. There's a very, there's a very much a, a, a correlation between how the 82nd and the 80 and the 101st felt about their time in England. Um, most of them were not anywhere near one of the major cities. It was very bu bucolic uh, lifestyle. It was very much a small town affair yeah. uh, feel to it. They were very much brought into the homes of the of the locals, and again, they may sometimes filling these these positions, these absentee uh, relatives. Yeah, um, that they are able to fill this gap, and uh, if there was a symbiotic relationship there. Um, the English families are able to kind of stand in for the the GIs families and the GIs were able to stand in for maybe a missing or or a lost family member. Yeah. And I I always remember talking to veterans of the 101st, especially the guys in in the 506 that were in Alborn uh and they they were they felt the same exact way as what you wrote about um in terms of how they felt about England. England was that safe space right it was that yeah the place where they had to be able they were able to settle in and then begin training in earnest yeah um, before they took off and i and i i know you have dozens and dozens of stories that uh, you probably like to talk about do you want to go to your uh your wheelhouse you want to go to the 505 <laughs> and talk about some of those fellas first yeah i mean uh, the 505 are a great example because um of, of why exactly england felt the way that it did for them because but so for anyone listening, because I, I I suspect that your podcast is ever so slightly one hundred and first leaning, um, but for for anyone <laughs> listening um, who isn't amazingly clued upon the eighty second, the five hundred five were the only reg parachute regiment of the six across the two divisions that jumped on D Day, but had seen combat before, so they'd made two jumps, uh, they'd made one into uh, Sicily uh, during Operation Husky in July. 43 and then again into italy um uh during operation avalanche um in behind the, the beach at salerno um and on both counts um the combat is is pretty intense um so when they come to england they're they're suddenly faced with a an environment in which everybody speaks the same language um Everybody lives a lifestyle that is at least similar to what they lived before they left the States. Um, there's no one trying to kill them. <laughs> Always, <laughs> a <bonus. is> a, <laughs> Always a bonus. Always a bonus. And of course, generally speaking, it's, it's the populace is very, very pleased to see them there because I had it described to me by, by a, not a corn resident. So the 505 were, were, camped in the grounds of a place called Quorn House in Quorn in Leicestershire. Um, and, and I had it recounted to me um, to a, by somebody that lived in Leicester at the time, which was the sort of key city where the, the 82nd campsites were sort of dotted around, who said that the presence of the Americans 
helped to endorse the feeling that the war was really starting to go back in the right direction, if that makes sense. The presence of the Americans, bearing in mind that obviously the British population had been through the Battle of Britain, and it wasn't until sort of you know forty one, forty two that we really started to see news come through that the tide was starting to change. But even then, there was still plenty of negative news, and the German bombers were overhead regularly. Um, and the presence of the eighty second and and Americans generally in in Leicestershire was, you know, you no, know, this has got to be a good sign, you know. Things yeah, are I mean, ramping for, up to for the better part of, of two years, England pretty much is going at it alone. So yeah. Um it's understandable how the how the, the general public would think um well the Americans are here. You start to see elements of the eighth Air Force arriving, yeah, uh, the twenty ninth division, which ends up going in and on, on Omaha um on D Day, and then you have the airborne divisions coming. Yeah, I I, I can understand that completely. Yeah. So it's so for the 505 in Quorn in particular, um, you know, I think that they, the, the, their prior experience had really given them reason to to dive right into making the most of the time that they had uh, in the UK or in England in, in general and to see the sites and to experience the local population uh, uh, in more ways than one <laughs> um, and to um, to see things that the reality is without the war, they would never probably have never got the chance to see. Um, so, I mean, you, you know, stories, stories from the 505 go, you know, from the very beginning, they, uh, they arrived. So they, they, they traveled by a, uh, Scotland to Leicestershire on a train and um, when they arrived uh, in in Leicestershire they arrived at a, a train station at, uh, in a little village called Barrow upon Saw which is just ever so slightly probably not even a mile north of Quorn and uh, and the first one of the best stories I was ever told about their arrival was that these guys left the train a, an absolute state um, they'd left all sorts of stuff on this train. And there was a guy called Peter Towers who spoke to myself and he spoke to my father-in-law at a Royal British Legion meeting several years ago. And now, unfortunately, this uh, Peter Towers has, has since passed away. But he, um, he, his dad was the station master at Barrow upon saw when 505 arrived. And after all the men had got on board and they'd been marched off to their new campsite, he ran along the entire length of the train, picking up uh, rations and all sorts of stuff that these guys had left behind. And if you can imagine, if you picture in your mind's eye, an old steam train, not like they are now, um, but the luggage racks above the soldiers' heads are all basically just suspended pieces of netting where they'd put all their equipment and their gear and whatnot. And he said he was walking along one carriage and there was a helmet up there. And Joe, you know as well as anyone now that an M2 paratrooper helmet is <laughs> worth a small fortune now if you can get a hold of one. Yeah. <laughs> and um, but back in the but back then, Peter Towers, who was just this young lad, just went, "Oh, that's an army helmet. I'm going to have that." So he took that. He took the helmet and um, and he said he he took it to their house. And then about two or three days later, there's a knock on the door, and he said he couldn't remember. Um, exactly what he said it was a, it was quite a high ranking um member of the, of the regiment it was either a lieutenant colonel or a colonel i'm thinking probably lieutenant colonel um very politely said to them it's my understanding that one of my men might have left his helmet on your train <laughs> could we please have it back <laughs> and uh, and peter towers obviously had to reluctantly uh, sort of <laughs> slink off to his bedroom and get this helmet back and give it turn, back to this colonel and turn over the contraband <laughs> exactly yeah and you've just got this mental image in your head of the of the, of, of the, the guys getting to their new campsite settling in and then the first route march they do or the first training exercise they do there's this one guy stood in line <laughs> without his helmet on and somebody's gone up to him and gone but where is your helmet and um <laughs> He's had to re give the bad news that he thinks he might have left it on this train. Um, but um, 
you know, I, it, and it's stories like that where, you, you know, you feel like shaking these people and going, you know, why didn't you get that guy's name? <laughs> you know, <laughs> why didn't you ask that Lieutenant Colonel what his name was? Because, <laughs> of course, now I would absolutely love to know who that was. Yeah, it's a bit um, lost to history at this point now. <laughs> absolutely. But unfortunately, yeah, it's just one of those things where back then, you know, and, and the whole helmet thing as well, you know, it reminds me, and it, and it, and again, it's going back to an e-company story, but years ago I was in Bastogne doing the route march around Bastogne and um, there, there'd been this new shop opened uh, opposite the um, opposite McAuliffe Square and um, Michel Dutre had one of his new books out about the, about the helmets and I was flicking through it and, uh, and Ed Shames was in the building. And I was with a with a friend of mine, and Ed Shames came over, and he just went, "Why do you guys like reading these books?" And we <laughs> said, "Well, you know, because it's it, it interests us." And he just went, "It's just a book about old army crap." <laughs> and we were like, "Yeah, but that's it, it's not old army crap to us, is it?" It's you know, sounds like Shames. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, just trying to explain to somebody who to to them it was just army surplus is yeah. like you know it's difficult, but. Yeah, so I mean, it's one of those things where a I wish that you know um, that Peter Towers had, had got this lieutenant colonel's name, but also, you know, again, if we'd got hold of one of those nowadays, the first thing we'd be looking for is an army serial number, serial or, number you know, yeah. a name or whatever. <laughs> yeah, without know, a the, doubt, <laughs> in the helmet just to see who who it belonged to. But um, yeah, so stories like that are, are great because they because you know Barrow upon saw train station unfortunately is not there anymore. The slip ramp that the guys would have walked up is still there. But um, it it's easy to picture all of this happening, you know, and, and it being, you know, it was the middle of February. It was, I believe it was the 14th of February they arrived there and um, it would have been old, probably raining because it's England. Uh, might even have been sleeting because it was February. It would have had, a, yeah, it would have been horrible. <laughs> um, but um, but how, yeah. how quickly do they roll into their their training cycles? I mean, and, and obviously, especially the 505, has has combat experience and they've got to be incorporating their lessons learned into the, the updated training but then you have the 508 and obviously the 504th is not there and the 507th gets attached to them for for the normandy operation so i mean how are they incorporating combat lessons um as they go forward i mean is it is it are there specific incidents that you can you can recall from your research about um how they are adapting training to be more combat reflective well to give you an idea of how quickly they were sort of thrown straight into it so there's a there's a photograph in um in my book which has featured in several books before um of a number of guys from a 505 in what you would uh, what you would say is not typical airborne attire uh mustards uh m41 jackets or tankers jackets their helmets um leaning against a stone wall um on a snow covered ground and of course these sort of photos get immediately picked up and are viewed upon as being the battle of the bulge or something like that because <laughs> there's snow um but it's actually along a wall um by a place called Rothley uh, chapel which is near Quorn, and it shows a 505 on a training uh, march or training, I think it was probably a map reading exercise or something along the lines of to get them the men familiar with the train around their camp. Um, but we can we can tell that that was within a fortnight of them being in Quorn because the last weekend of February 1944 was the only weekend when the regiment was in the UK that it snowed heavily. So the snow gives us an indication of when that photograph was taken. Yeah. So they're straight into into things like that. I mean, I've actually started putting together a um, a list based on a combination of research from uh, from the airborne divisions themselves and also from um, Nine Troop Carrier Command to show when practice parachute jumps started. And the first recorded parachute jump was in the middle of march 1944 so yep. uh, about a month after the regiment or the division had arrived in the uk it's actually for the um the, the first divisional parachute jump which was on the 18th of march 
shows actually how fast the 507th and the 508th were thrown into training because those two regiments didn't actually arrive in England until March 44. So almost the moment their boots are on the ground in England, they are jumping onto C-47s and making jumps into drop zones um, fairly local to their campsites. Yeah, and they don't uh, They don't have a lot of time, really, when you think about it. They've only got a few months, but they have no idea that that's coming. I mean, they, they probably have an idea they're going to get thrown into another operation, but they don't know what the time frame is at this point. No, um, absolutely. I mean, it's... Un it, unlike the forces that are going to get landed by uh, amphibious assault craft, where you're uh, kind of beholden to the tides... Yeah, they're not restricted by that because they they're coming. They're doing vertical envelopment from the air, so yeah, um, they could go any time. Absolutely, yeah. So I mean, it's and 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 as you say, um, you know, from the middle of March through to the execution of D Day, um, you know, what is it? Three months, something like that, less than. Um, so although obviously we all know um, the sort of intensity of the training that the guys went through in the states, and they're all jump qualified bar you know a few individuals by the time that the division arrives in the uk they are thrown into um what the very higher echelon of the division would know is a very short span to prepare them for uh what's coming and obviously with james gavin in particular being very heavily involved in the planning of the airborne side of um of operation neptune from um uh, from 43 onwards he knows what what they have to what the division has got to achieve in that short span of time and obviously from an 82nd perspective as well gavin is very conscious of the fact that so one of one of the things that it, again is worth pointing out from an 82nd perspective as you rightly pointed out at the very start of the pod is that the five the, the 82nd lose essentially are um are, are have one of their key regiments taken away from them which is a 504, which is kept back in Anzio. And they don't arrive back in the UK and rejoin the division until the April of 1944. So less than two months before D-Day. And even at that point, Gavin has his fingers crossed, but when he finally goes and meets with Reuben Tucker, the regimental commander, and he gets the chance to inspect the 504, that they're going to be in a fit condition to be involved in D-Day. And Gavin is 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 famously quoted for having basically realised the moment he saw the regiment arrive on trains in Leicestershire that that was never going to happen. Um, they were hugely depleted in numbers. Um, they'd lost a lot of equipment. Their weaponry was unserv basically unserviceable. Yeah. The conditions they'd been fighting in at Anzio were pretty poor. A lot of the time, the guys were essentially operating from foxholes that had six or ten inches of water in the bottom of them things like that um and they were so, kind of used they were kind of used like a, a fire brigade right they were used to plug holes in the in the lines and kind yeah. of rushed around quite a bit it was very chaotic for them in terms of deployments um yeah. very very uh very difficult campaign for the 504 and um you know the the i don't think the general world war ii history public kind of understands um the kind of um difficulties they had to deal with in italy before they came back um, and like you said, I mean, the general condition of the regiment was uh, they were in terrible shape. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Gavin made a point of, you know, he picked Ruben Tucker up from the train station in his Jeep and he drove um, he drove him to the new campsite, which was just outside the, the village of Evington. And um, supposedly they had quite a frank conversation about the fact that the 504th was not going to be involved on D-Day, which was obviously very much to the disappointment of Reuben Tucker, who firmly believe that regardless of his regiment's condition, if his regiment could be provided with new uniforms and equipment and service weapons, they would still have a very important role to play. But obviously Gavin had to be sort of pragmatic in that sense and 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 recognise that um, it was better for the regiment to spend the time that it needed to become whole again if you want to call it that but that moment for gavin it must have been a moment of realization that that what it left him with was two regiments in the 507 and the 508 who were completely green 
and needed the time to meet the standards that the 82nd had set for itself in Sicily and in Italy um, the year before, in the, in the year uh, six months or so beforehand. Um, so Gavin would have been, as I say, very conscious of what these guys needed to do to get up to um, to get up to standard. Um, one of the things that I've always been um, quite outspoken on is is this perception that the Airborne didn't train with the troop carrier units in the run up to D Day, um, and particularly um, if I if I'm going to name names, I'll name names. Stephen <laughs> Ambrose's book um, D Day essentially accuses Nine Troop Carrier Command of not carrying out any nighttime operations in preparation for D Day. Um, uh, it, so interestingly, I uh, <laughs> I stumbled across some of the, the conversations between some of the troop carrier pilots and a, a gentleman by the name of Randy Hills. Randy yes, was a yes. troop carrier historian. He's no longer with us, yeah. but he did some really groundbreaking uh, research. And then Lou Johnston's study of the troop carrier operation for D-Day. And it, essentially, all of it was done to refute the implications that that the troop carrier command one had acted like cowards and two did not know how to do their jobs which was roundly refuted by these veterans 100 um, percent, yeah and and i very interestingly in that discussion and and i just released our podcast's first newsletter for our our patreon subscribers um and i'll be glad to send you a copy of it um it basically out of Serial 12, which carried the second time of the 506th, and one of the lead pilots, a guy by the name of Morton, was piloting Stick 64 into the DZ. He was able to watch Stick 58 get shot out of the sky uh, in front of him. And uh, for the folks that don't know, um, 58 carried uh, elements of Dog Company and Second Battalion headquarters. And one of the, the jump masters, a guy named Pat Sweeney, who uh, fans of Band of Brothers and Easy Company who have read a lot about them will, will know the name uh, Sweeney. Um, Muir, the pilot, Marvin Muir, kept his aircraft in the air long enough for every jumper to get off before the aircraft impacted. Um, yeah. But the interesting thing is Morton describes how um, the inclement weather plans for how to maintain formation he he breaks it down in, you know in the states for military personnel we, we call it barney style for the barney character you know break it down to the basic level so children can understand it right yeah so he breaks it down barney style and explains hey when the weather goes this way this is the way we react he's yeah. like but my lead plane got shot out of the sky so this is how we would react when that happens i just thought it was so interesting to read how these men looked at how ambrose wrote about them yeah. And then sat down in a very studious manner and refuted everything. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, weather, enemy, time, and terrain get a vote. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And in this case, they couldn't control the weather and they, they stuck with their standard operating procedures for inclement weather and, and loss of visual sight of the, of the aircrafts around you. Um, and they did the best they could to get their, get their jumpers to their drop zone. So yeah. Yeah. I, you don't have to pretend you're not going to drop names. You can drop names here. Um, <laughs> we're not, we're not crapping on anybody. If you, if you write a book and you know this, you got to own up with your writ, you wrote, you've written. Yeah. Uh, in this case, yeah. he, he made a mistake in judgment and, um, and it was poorly researched and he didn't talk to the troop carrier veterans because he would have gotten a, I think it would have been a much more richly enhanced history if he would have yeah well because i mean he would have gotten those nuances but to, to go back to you yes uh i understand completely because i actually been diving down that rabbit hole recently <laughs> yeah well i mean it's it, it, it you know ambrose is is far from the only one you know there there are others i mean i i i I understand as well through through Randy Hill's research that SLA Marshall admitted that he hadn't spoken to troop carrier veterans. And really? when you actually think about when SLA, SLA Marshall wrote um, Night Drop, he has no excuse for it because no. he had potentially thousands of aircrew that flew the operations that night. And he, who, had, carte, he had carte blanche to speak with them. Exactly. Too. There were no um, restrictions for him interviewing these men. 
Yeah, and it, and it, and it, it's in my in my eyes, it is it's no different than trying to interpret as best you can the nature of an engagement between force A and force B. To understand it properly, you need to speak to both sides if you can. And from the airborne operations on on D Day, speaking to the airborne men. And then not the guys that were flying the aircraft is flawed research because it's, a, it's akin to neg neg negligence. I'm sorry, excuse me. Yes, yeah, I I would agree. It's um, yeah, it is. It and it and it's 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 always been a bit of a bugbear of mine, and it's something that, as I say, I've been I've done a few podcasts about Troop Carrier Command in the past, and I've always sort of nudged it into the podcast, but um. If if anyone is listening to this and still believes the story that the troop carrier pilots were cowards or they were poorly trained or they didn't know what they were doing, you told me I could swear earlier. It's bollocks. <laughs> it, yeah. it is. Hey, you know what? You're setting yourself up for a second <laughs> appearance on the show because like, <laughs> we're definitely um, going to come back and talk to you more about troop carriers. So <laughs> yeah, well that'd be great. But but yeah. <laughs> But they, but, but but you're to 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 backtrack to your point though. The 82nd didn't have as much time to work with these fellas, unlike the 101st who had been since September, and they worked with the same squadrons that would end up dropping them on D-Day. It yeah. builds up a lot of familiarity and a lot of understanding yeah. about how how that well, flight crew or those that squadron operates. Well, one advantage that the 82nd did have, and um, it, I I did a, a a talk at a memorial ceremony with a friend of mine called Darren did fairly recently uh, in uh, Nottinghamshire for two members of the division that were killed in practice jumps, and somebody asked the question, "Why were the 82nd billeted in uh, where they were? Why was why were less why was Leicestershire and and for the five or seven and the five eight Nottinghamshire chosen as a as a place for them to be camped and um, the simple answer, I think, is because the 52nd Troop Carrier Wing was was stationed in at five airfields, roughly an hour away from where the 82nd were camped, and the 52nd were the were the Troop Carrier Wing that had, had deployed the lion's share of the parachute element of the division during the operations over Sicily and Italy. So there was that joint cooperation, which obviously it made sense to try and maintain moving forward, um, but at the same time. The 52nd Troop Carrier Wing had never worked with the 507 or the 508. So, but the other interesting thing is that the morning reports for the division indicate that when when the 507 from the 508 did do drops, there were liaison officers from the 505th present during these drops. So there is some transfer of expertise, if you want to call it mm -hmm. that. There, there are guys there guiding them on on how to improve what they're doing um, yeah there's some there's some cross decking of that that combat experience to kind of bs check <laughs> the, absolutely uh, what and they're I, doing I, yeah and i think that this that this leads on to and again it's something else i've mentioned in the past the reason why generally speaking i say generally speaking the three regiments of the 82nd that jumped on d-day look like they're carrying less than the 101st. And I've always wondered whether that's the 505th going to these airfields for the practice jumps with the 507 and the 508th. And you can just even imagine these sort of grisly two-jump veterans of the 505 walking by these guys and doing a little bit like a bull random one in Band of Brothers and going, you don't need that, you don't need that. Yeah. Get rid of that, you know, because when when it when it all counts you know, these are the, are the pieces of equipment that you're going to need on the day. Um, and I, and I, I, I would like to think anyway, that that is that there, there are, there are certainly influences from the 505 in that regard when it comes to the practice jumps and, um, and, and the, the real thing on D-Day. Well, I, I would say that, I, I would say that you're completely right in your assessment there, because when you look at it and you look at Gavin's intent to get to 507th and 508th, into the training cycle very early to get them up to speed. And then you look at the performance on D-Day, especially around the Lafayette area. Um, I think that his intuition in doing that um, uh, bore, bore its fruit on D-Day. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the seizing of that critical ground, 
Coquinier and, and, and Lafayette Manor and holding the bridge and that whole area and then Chef Dupont, you, you can't argue with the results. No, um, absolutely, yeah. And and yes, did bad things happen? Did did paratroopers drop and and drown? Yes, they did. You can't control um, what the enemy does on the battlefield. You can influence it. You can't control it. And the flooding of a lot of those marshes. And I've been there in multiple seasons around Lafayette, and I've seen both with the flooding and without the flooding. Um, I thought that the their their tactical level performance was outstanding. So again, you can't argue with the results um, I, I i would agree wholeheartedly and i also think that um I, I, with the exception of one individual <laughs> the <laughs> officer ranks of the of the three parachute regiments were filled with extremely good soldiers um there are guys whose names seldom really get spread around all that much men like first lieutenant john marr um and with a 507 mm -hmm. you know what he does at lafayette is is incredible um <laughs> without, again i don't want to go go off on a, on a huge seg a segue here but you know what he does in combat is on the, on that first day and and his movements on on june 6th in particular and how they ultimately go on to influence what happens around the lafayette area everybody should know about but his his name's not well, his name might be on a memorial at Lafayette actually, but his name is not it's not common knowledge. You know, he, he's not a James Gavin, he's not a Charles de Glopper, who obviously deserves everything he gets for winning the Medal of Honor, um, where he did. But but men like John Marr were extremely good officers. But bearing in mind that again, as I say, these were men who who when they jumped on D Day were learning everything um that comes with facing a real enemy for the first time on the job, you know, and um, formed excellently. So. Oh, come on. Say one of my favorites, one of my favorite officers. Can you, can you, can you guess he's a 505 man? Favorite officers. Of the 82nd, 505 man. Come on. Was it? Uh, oh, well, there's so many of them. You'd have to give me more clue. Uh, first letter in, in his first and last name are the same. His first and last name are the same. Waverly oh, the Ray. First... You what? Sorry. Waverly Ray. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The um, the the silent, the the quiet officer of the five hundred fifth. Yeah, yeah. The actions, his actions, sort of north of um of Saint Mary Glees, well, yeah, in, in that area. Yeah, in, and in... and listen, you can always name drop these guys here because what I hope is that our listeners will hear a name and hear about an action. Yeah. And they'll start going and doing that research on their own and learning about these men because like I, when I first started reenacting, it was well after band of brothers had come out. Um, and I remember the 82nd reenactors were, they had a bit of the attitude of what the 82nd airborne veterans had was you guys are like new to the game, rookies, <laughs> yeah blah 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 and these 82nd guys knew that knew the stuff and knew how to do it right and i i imagine that's that's exactly the same way the 80, the real 82nd vets and the 101st guys um bantered back and forth but um yeah. i i always uh, took the time to do the to the readings and stuff and and waverly ray was one of the ones that really caught my interest and i'm hoping that every time you drop a name of an 82nd veteran yeah, somebody will go out, or, or any veteran on any of our shows that 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 our listeners will go out and do a little bit more research and understand. Yeah, uh, understand these men because well, um, since you since you say just that, giants, just giants. When you think uh, about the things they accomplished, uh, absolutely, yeah. Well, since you say that, there is I, I do have one good story about the five hundred five in Quorn that relates to a to an officer that 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 went on to be killed on D Day with the five hundred five, and and uh, that's a guy. Um, by the name of Major James McGinnity, who was uh, the XO of the 1st Battalion going into Normandy. Um, and he was killed by machine gun fire moving on the, the manor, um, which is next to the bridge. Uh, and uh, he was, um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, I have just opened a piece of research to, and I hope that I'd noted it down, but apparently not. I can't remember what state in America he was from, but he was a, he was a West Pointer. Um, and he was a key, a really, really keen horse rider. Um, 
which makes me think tech makes me think Texas, but I'm not sure that's that's correct. But anyway, so when he when he arrived in Quorn, um he he learned quite early on that in Quorn there's 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 the Quorn hunt, which is um a fox hunt. Mm-hmm. And one of the first things he did when he got some spare time was he went to the Quorn hunt and he said, um, can I um can I please ride one of your horses just to you know just because he enjoyed it so much. And ended up becoming really close friends with the people that ran the hunt and ended up going out on hunts with them, uh, riding the horses, which I think is such a great story of, again, the the, the personal connection between um, between the, the guys in the 505 and the locals that lived in Quorn. Um, and of course, then you think about the sadness that they would have felt in learning that he'd been killed in Normandy. Um, but he again, you know, he's one of these officers where when you read up about his his prior time with the regiment, you learn about the respect that his men had for him and how he looked like the sort of guy that was shooting his way up the chain of command within within the regiment. Um, obviously, the, the first battalion, 505, lost so many key officers um, fighting in the Lafayette area, of course, including the, the battalion commander, Frederick Kellum, who was killed on the bridge and the Guinity was the rightful heir for that that post um which uh, obviously ended up being um sort of taken up by mark alexander before he ended up all over the place but yeah it's um you know the the, the story those stories and i i didn't know that about james beginnity until i contacted his family and he had written letters home talking about the, the time he'd spent in england riding horses and it it was it's these simple things that the men got such enjoyment out of that made you know Quorn feel like a, a home to them at the time, um, and you know that Quorn is one of the one of the one of the few places in in the UK that really embraces the history, the link with the eighty second. They've got the the eighty second Airborne Gate, which is on Stafford Orchard, which is a a, a gate which is named in honour of the division. They've got um, several memorials, including one which is a plaque that's on a, a piece of stone that came out of Nijmegen Church. And uh, there's a pub called the White Horse in the, on the cross in Quorn, which has got um, pictures of the regiment and the campsite on the wall. And they've got a, a function room named after the name for the 505. You know, they they really embrace it. And, um, and you know, one of the things I always say is that, you know, that villages like Warren should be incredibly proud of the link that they have with with these guys because, as you say, you know they're, they're giants by any standards. They went and did things that you know most of us can't even you know uh, imagine doing. Um, and and but the key thing is is that they provided the officers and the men of the five hundred five and all the other regiments somewhere that they could call home for six or seven months yeah. um without doubt I, uh, I i think for a lot of our listeners especially because we do draw a lot of our audience from uh fans of band of brothers and i think a lot of them would correlate that to to dick winter's writings about how allborn was such the perfect place for him to spend his time before they went into combat it allowed him to center himself focus himself and be the best version of himself before they went into combat but i think there's also those like you said the little stories like uh many years ago i was uh, provided um robert raider who was in easy's first platoon i was provided his me- uh, memoir it, it was an unpublished memoir and he talked a lot of those little details and i think one of the things that kind of stood out to me and i know it's a very a small thing is but the, how the men of the company were addicted to lardy cakes like <laughs> yeah. just these these small little things that that made it more like home or made things more bearable yeah to them um which is why they always i don't think there was a single man i ever spoke to that was had spent time in england that didn't recall it fondly mm-hmm. um so yeah I, I to me this is like i said it's a perfect run up show towards towards the d-day anniversary and um you're providing all those those insights of those those great men and and, yeah. and what they had to do and, and and again unlike the 101st they came out of combat and then this respite i mean it must have been almost perfectly timed for them mm. 
in terms of coming out of combat and being able to kind of downshift a little bit and center yourself and get back to being normal and you know knowing what it's like to eat on on plates again or or you yeah. know go to the loo or you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. instead of you know being in a foxhole and sleeping in the dirt in the mud um, yeah absolutely yeah i mean another another good story that that i always i always think fondly of of, of the, the division's time in the uk um was it was actually a story i learned from uh marty morgan i don't know if you know marty um, oh yeah so back in 2013, when we did the memorials that I mentioned earlier, one of them was for the 507th at their campsite at a place called Tolleton Hall in Nottinghamshire. Mm -hmm. And Tolleton Hall is, um, the village of Tolleton is very, for anyone listening, picture an idyllic, typical British village, English village. Tolleton is that. And it's got Tolleton Hall, which was this great big former country house and hotel, a, a, a manor house, basically. And the campsite was on the grounds there. And um, as as the guys had been given a warning to sort of prepare all their gear for for what many presumably would have would have assumed was another training exercise, but some of them I guess would have known was something more serious. They pulled all of their M three fighting knives together and took them to a um, a place in Nottingham um, to have them all sharpened. And when they went to collect them the gentleman that had spent hours sharpening them all refused to take payment for the work he'd done. And it was obviously, and it was because he knew that these guys were going to go and, and die on behalf of this country, basically. Um, and I believe Marty said that um, he used words, something along the lines of you guys will pay for these soon, which is, you know, obviously, a good example of you know that sort of camaraderie between the british and the americans and the recognition that you know they were there to do to do a job on behalf of not just themselves but for for us as a nation and for everybody really so it's yeah it's, it's another one of the, the good stories um that, that so, comes out of their time yeah just a, a beautiful way to uh, uh you know come to come to a conclusion uh, with this and um I have to tell you, it's been a, it's been great. But you volunteered yourself to come back on and talk troop carrier at some other point. I got to tell you, so I'll do that whenever you like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, once again, um, we're going to have all the links so where you can find. Um, we're going to have the links where you can find Adam's books. But if you want to pitch it, go right ahead again where they're available. I know most of our listeners are in the in the U.S., but um, I, I got a feeling after listening to you talk about these guys, they're going to, there's going to be a lot of folks that are going to want to get copies of your, your book. So where can we find them again? Okay. So, um, the, the book, the biography of George Schenkel and my book about the eight seconds time in the UK, they're both available at Overlord Publishing. Um, one thing I do, I am keen to point out is that when we wrote George's book, he was adamant that, that he didn't want to make money off it. So the proceeds from the sale of George's book go to a charity um, that that was close to his heart in the States, um, which, assumably, I can't remember the name of now, but I think it helps disadvantaged children in the States. So even, even obviously, George has, has since passed away, the proceeds through his book still go towards that charity. Um, as for the troop carrier books, hopefully June 6th, Volume one will be available again. Uh, volume two will be released over the anniversary of Operation Market Garden. And myself and Hans will be in Holland over the anniversary of Market Garden. So if you, if anyone happens to be there, uh, I do believe we'll be selling copies of the book at the Ginkle Heath um, event on the 21st of September. Uh, both of those books will be released by Flying Pencil, but I understand that they'll be available um all over so wonderful and if folks want to give you a follow you're on twitter um, i am yeah so they, I they can catch up with you there my um tag is now aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't worry we'll put it out there for everybody to follow anyway it'll end up on our instagram as well um for for those of you uh just catching this uh, that want to become uh supporters of the we're not lost private podcast you can find us on patreon you can also find us on Instagram. Uh, you can give me a follow on uh, Twitter, X, whatever we're calling it this week. You can also find me on Facebook. You can find the We're Not Lost Private Podcast on Facebook as well. 
Um, thanks to everyone for stopping by. Adam, thanks for your understanding. Um, yeah, we're bat we're batting one batter short for this game, so I apologize, but I think we had a we had a pretty good go of it, and yeah, uh, no, I really fine, appreciate yeah. you coming out and uh, talking about uh, about the eighty second boys, as my friends uh, in the divisions would say. It's a great day to be double A. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, thanks. no problem. Pleasure. Thanks, everyone.